the Lord. I am not, I've never had, I've had some struggles. I've had some carnality in my life for times, a lot of ignorance and a lack of light and immaturity that was there. But I don't ever, ever, ever remember, and I have to be honest, I don't ever, ever remember entertaining the idea of leaving God, of going back on Him, and going out and back to that world. I don't ever remember that, and I, I'm just so glad that I have Him here today and that He's with us. I, I didn't say that to condemn or to make some folks feel bad that when went out and come back. Well, you ought to feel bad if you went out and stayed out, but if you come back, you ought to rejoice in the mercy of God. Amen. But I say that because you don't have to go back. You don't have to entertain that idea. God is, is wonderful and he's able to satisfy us and thrill us every day. It doesn't get worse. It doesn't get boring. It doesn't get old. It gets richer and it gets sweeter. I, I've preached out of this Bible and, and shared the word of God many, many times and, and have read it, but it just doesn't get old. It doesn't become outdated. It doesn't become irrelevant. It doesn't become something that's like an antique and a relic that you shove on a shelf and say, well, that was yesteryear. And you know, it's nice to learn the story. And it's interesting to learn the history, but it has no bearing on today's life. This book has more bearing today than it's ever had. And it's more relevant than it's ever been. It's so relevant in our lives. And I just thank God for His Word and the light that it, it just shines on our path. I'm so glad to walk in this book. Take your Bibles in hand. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. There's some preaching and teaching from the Word of God today. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Again, we welcome our visitors. We're glad you're here. We're just glad to be here. And again, taking some time to dig in this wonderful book. We want to grow. Amen. We want to grow. I hope you want to grow and mature. I shared with the ministers at, at the convention. Sometimes pastors just pull messages out of the clouds. and You know, that's actually a literal term on the Internet now. You can store stuff on the cloud. They call it the cloud. And uh, you can store stuff there. And fellas, I reckon, can go and just pull things out. Sometimes fellas want to preach a message because it's exciting. They want to preach it because it's just... We know it got an amen in one church, maybe to get an amen in another church. Or sometimes they just, just try to find something to preach, you know, just whatever, kind of shake the bush and see what comes out. You never know. If you shake it hard enough, an old rabbit or something will run out somewhere. You can get a hold of it and, and go down some rabbit trail and be able to preach something to somebody. But, but the object of preaching and teaching is to make us mature saints. The object of preaching and teaching is to perfect saints so they can go to work so we can edify the body of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. So my goal this morning in preaching you the Word of God is to, is to grow you, is to perfect you. And that word perfect there literally means to equip. And sometimes it's not a message that, you know, you're already a mature Christian. You're already someone who's living in victory and in the power of God. You're not tossed about by every wind of doctrine. You're not a child in the faith. You're strong. You've overcome the wicked one. The Word of God abides in you. You may even be a father, as the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2. You've known him that's from the beginning. And you may be one that's able to bring others into the kingdom of Christ. But we still need preaching and teaching. We're going to need it, church. We're going to need it. And part of that perfecting is not just to take the young ones and, and bring them to maturity, but it's an idea of equipping us. And sometimes, we're, sometimes we just need a word about where we are and what we're doing and, and the significance of the day in which we're living and the, and the significance of our time and the battle that we're facing. And, and uh, sometimes, if you're not careful too, that old world can creep in and you not know it. Sometimes uh, that slothfulness or complacency, sometimes that, that lackadaisical attitude, sometimes there can be things that can just kind of find their way to a place of influence in our life and, and, and we're not really as watchful as we need to be and we're not as diligent as we need to be and we miss it. And so preaching has that object as well to discover those things and to bring us 
to full-fledged, uh, equipped saints ready to do the work of God. We're going to stand and read this passage. I'm just going to read uh, a couple of verses, not the entire passage I've been reading. This is my third message on this series. And we're going to try to hang here for a little while until we finish it over the next uh, few services. I, I don't know, the passage has been stirring my heart again. And I believe it is, again, where God wants us to, to see and learn some things. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13 and verse 14. The Bible says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. There are other things in a passage I'll deal with later, and, and I'm not even going to deal with the particular of this verse, but I'm going to deal with it in the context of the book. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Would you say amen to God's Word? Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and begin there. Paul ended the letter, as I shared, this is the third message that I am sharing about the Corinthian challenge. The Corinthian challenge. Paul said when he finished this letter, it's quite a lengthy letter, really. When you consider the length of the letter that he wrote to Colossae, the length of the letter that he wrote to Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, uh, when you consider the length of the, church, the letter to the churches in Galatia, and when you consider the length of other letters, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is quite a lengthy epistle. It is, uh, he has quite a bit to say to this church, and this is not a church that he has spent just a few days at. He spent 18 months establishing this work in Corinth. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18. And the apostle Paul was in that city. He had arrived there after coming from Athens. He'd had a big disappointment in Athens. Uh, he'd been run out of town in Thessalonica and Berea. And, uh, and when he got to Athens, he was on the run, so to speak. And he got there, and the city's filled with idolatry. And he tries to go out there basically and debate with them. And, and I don't doubt that he did the right thing as far as that goes. But he he took him up there and challenged them. He debated them. As far as I'm concerned, he won the debate. He had the best argument in that regards. I mean, how can you argue with the resurrection? If you want to worship uh, uh, stones and sticks and, and dead inanimate things, well, go right at it. But I, I'm going to uh, worship the one who conquered death. I, I'm going to worship the one who went into death. I mean, I'm going to tell you, if there's one thing that comes to all of us, it's death. And, and let, let us look at this man and worship the one who has conquered it entered into it and exited it with power over it. That's the one that we need to look to. But he arrived there and he got, I think, to Corinth and Corinth is so wicked. Athens is, is full of idolatry. And, and you know what? He only got a few in that kind of intellectual uh, uh, debating culture that just wants to question everything, find every new thing and get something stirred up. They just love this idea of debate and we live in that kind of world. Quite frankly, Paul didn't have much success in that that kind of culture. And he goes to Corinth and he's probably wondering, you know, how am I going to make it? How are we going to get this thing done? And, and, and he, the Bible said he was among them in fear and much trembling. He wrote to them and said, when I was among you, I was in fear and much trembling. I think he felt a sense of, uh, uh, maybe a sense of coming off of Athens, uh, a little bit of defeat, a little bit of how are we going to reach this culture? He's also looking around. It's a wicked city. It is a wicked city of sexual perversion and sexual sin that abounds in it. It's a terrible place to live. It's full of idolatry. It's full of adultery and fornication. Homosexuality and effeminence is prevalent in this city. And he may be overwhelmed a little bit by that. How are we going to make it here in this city? I don't think the synagogue, if there is one, but very, very strong there. And we can read again about it in Acts chapter 18. But the point about it is, as Paul said, I came to you and, I, and, and, he, and he talks about, I, I wasn't among you and, and tried to reach you with the enticing words uh, of man's wisdom. It almost seemed that he had tried that at Athens and it didn't work too well. He went to Athens and there's no demonstration of power. It's the debate. It's the enticing words of, of man's wisdom. It's trying to reach them through the power of the argument and the power of having a better uh, a discussion or a better debating, uh, a better sense of reason, if you will. But I'm telling you, reason uh, is right and the Bible's reasonable. Christianity is reasonable. It's logical. It's truth. The debate is really non-existent when it comes down to it. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to reach me in just by reason. Uh, there's got to be a demonstration of the power of God. There's got to be that which can reach in and break the power of darkness.
focus. The light of God has got to shine to the heart and it's got to reach and penetrate the depths of their soul and illuminate them and cause them to see that they are living under the bondage and the enslavement of sin. Paul got to Corinth, he said, he said, I sought and done know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. He said that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He said, I didn't want you to put your trust in, in the ability of men to present an argument. I didn't want you to put your trust in the ability of men to out-argue all of the skeptics and, and out-argue all of those that are out there on the, on the circuit among the Greeks and uh, espousing their philosophies and their ideas. Uh, he said, what I wanted you to see is that God's power is real. The kingdom of God is not in word but in power. He said, the kingdom of God is not built upon mere, a mere principle. It's not built upon an argument. It's not built upon simply a better moral system. The kingdom of God is built on the real power of God because God is real. His presence is real. His power is real. His kingdom is supreme and it's sovereign over all and I'm telling you that no matter what this world gives, no matter what they present to us, God is greater than the power of darkness and the power of this world. And that's what we need to see. That the Christian life is not just a higher moral life. It's a life of power. It's a life of strength. It's a life of victory over sin and selfishness. And somewhere, the apostle comes to this church and he spends a lot of time with them. He'll leave from there and and go on but but he writes at Ephesus he gets to Ephesus and he writes back to this church and he hears their problems and he writes a lengthy letter and he finishes that letter and says watch stand fast watch you stand fast in the faith quit you like men be strong let all your things be done with charity those are pretty tough words I've had to say that to a few people I've had to look at the eyes of some folks and say it's time for you to man up. You got a tough challenge ahead of you. You've got a difficult road. You're struggling, you're weak, and you're weary. Quit your belly aching. Quit worrying about how much it hurts. Quit worrying about your, your feelings. Don't put the blame on somebody else. Man up. Because this is the time that separates the men from the boys. When Paul got done writing this letter, that's what he told him. Man up. Quit you like men. Be a man about it. Yeah, I've, I've written you a pretty tough letter. I've said some hard things to you. I, I, I've, I've told you, showed you you're not as wise as you think you are. You're not as spiritual as you think you are. I've told you that you're babes and you thought you were mature. I've told you that you're carnal and you thought you were spiritual. I've told you you're fools and you thought you were wise. But well, you can get all down in the mouth about it. You can let your hands hang down. You can get upset. You can go get mad at the preacher. You can get upset at the Apostle Paul and stay in your carnality. Stay in your weakness. Stay in your immaturity. You can stay there in your place of, of, of pride and self-confidence or, or you can man up, uh, face the challenges that are before you and go forward in Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to grow. We're going to get beyond this and we're going to build the G church of Jesus Christ in the middle of a world of antagonism and enmity. We're going to build the faith of Jesus Christ. Correct our weaknesses. Correct our wrongs. Correct our, our, our difficulties and, and get beyond them. And I've shared with you two things, or I've dealt with the chapters 1 through 5. I said, what is it that caused Paul to say this? What has been going on in this church? And what is the battle, the challenge that they are facing? And I talked with you in the first cha uh, four chapters that they are facing in the battle for their church unity. And Paul dealt the whole one-fourth of the book is devoted to this principle of church unity. And then we come to the principle of purity. Verse chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And we're going to deal with 6 and 7 today. And that is the battle for purity. If the church is ever facing a battle for purity, it's now. It's now. And that purity is in three areas. In chapter 5, it was the purity of the feast. And we talked about that. In chapter 6, it's the purity of faith, and I'm going to deal with that. If you take your Bibles, and I, I, want, to, I want to show you, and I'm going to have to just walk through this chapter, so follow with me. So you, you may want to make some notes, go back and look at it and explore it and spend some time with it later, and I challenge you to do that because there's a lot of meat that Paul has placed in these chapters, and I'm going to deal with this idea of the battle for purity. In this idea of the battle of purity in, this, in the realm of our faith, 
We've got to keep our faith pure. In chapter 5, we've got to keep the feast pure. In chapter uh, 6, the faith pure. And in chapter 7, the family pure. And let's look at it. What's the problem going on in chapter 6? Well, the first part of the uh, chapter, he talks about this idea that, that we've got brothers that have problems among themselves. Uh, they've got uh, grievances. They've got offenses between them. And it appears they're not doctrinal issues. They are not moral issues in the sense that there's a, a difference uh, of doctrine. It's a difference of faith. Uh, it's not over anything that someone has preached. Uh, it's not over a sense of uh, uh, any spiritual aspect. It appears that it's over carnal things again. It appears they're differing over possibly property rights, uh, over things that can be settled in a court of law. You can't settle. Even then you could not do it and you cannot do it in America today. Thank the Lord that our courts at least still, it seems that they will, will not involve themselves in church matters today. If we have a member and we discipline a member and we, we put that member out of the church based upon our faith and that member wants to sue the church, uh, if, if they follow court precedent, if they follow the precedent, then the courts today have consistently, uh, have consistently ruled that that's a church matter. It's a matter of faith and it's not for the courts to decide. However, that church decides and that's the way that needs to be and that's been consistent throughout the court decisions in America for, for since its inception. And I thank God for it. But now they're going to law against one another. So if they're going to law against one another, it has to be in the realm of something to do with material things or, or, or again, some maybe some misdemeanor or it's not some uh, gross crime or something like that. But someone's rights have been violated. Someone's rights have been violated. I don't know, maybe somebody borrowed something and didn't bring it back. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe somebody moved their property line a, a little bit too far. Uh, maybe somebody, I don't know, they're slaved in something or whatever. I don't know what they are. We're not told it except that the fact is, uh, is that in order for them to settle the issue, they are taking these two brothers that go to church on Sunday together, that worship together during the week. Uh, they're going out there and they're going to the courts of the world uh, and they're asking unregenerated people. They're asking sinners. They're asking those that are living in darkness to, to make a decision between brothers, not on a doctrinal matter, not on a, well they couldn't do that anyway, but on a matter that everybody else brings to the court. And so that the appearance is this, the church is acting no different than the world. Every day of the week, the judges have the courts filled with bickering, fussing, discontented people. And now the two that come before him are supposedly Christians. They are brothers. They are brothers in the Lord. They profess to be members of the body of Christ. They profess to be renewed and born again, living in the light of Jesus Christ. They profess to be followers of the one that died and gave his life for mankind. They profess to be followers of the one that said, if a man sues your law and takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. If he compels you to go a mile, go with him two miles. If he smites you on the right cheek, turn to him the other all, or the left turn to him the other also. I'm telling you right now that they know, and here are the ones that follow the teaching of Jesus Christ, but they are acting and bickering and fussing exactly like the world. Paul said two things to that response or to that problem. He responded two ways. Number one, don't you have folks among you that are wise enough that they can make a decision and bring you two brothers back together and, and unity and peace? Isn't there anybody among you? And basically Paul comes down, set the ones that are least esteemed. He said, basically, you take the nobodies in the church. Probably the ones that you think aren't as spiritual. The ones that maybe you think don't have as much or, or they're not as far advanced in the kingdom of God. I guarantee you they could render a decision. Because I will tell you this, that the saint with the least amount of light is far wiser than the sinner with no light whatsoever. Amen. The saint that has the least the light of God's presence in their life. They've got the light of the cross of Calvary shining in. They've got the light of the new birth and the regenerating power of God. That much light is far greater than anything the world knows. And the 
most intelligent sinner, my friend, does not have any light whatsoever. He's still walking in darkness. Uh, the kingdom of God is not built on the intellect uh, of man. It's not built upon the principles that the world builds on. It's built on the wisdom of God. Uh, and even the most immature Christian has at least the presence of Christ in them. It is more light than even the greatest sinner, if you can say it that way, in this world has. Second thing he said is, just, why don't you just let it go? Why don't you just suffer yourself to be defrauded? Did Jesus not suffer himself to be defrauded on Calvary? I mean, think about it. Why don't you just let it go? Is it really worth destroying the purity and the unity of the church? Think about it, what you're doing. You're going out of that church or that world and you're sending a message to them that the church operates on the same principles of the world. We're just like you folks. We bicker over our rights and we fuss over our wrongs that have been done to us and so much so that we're going to take our brother to court over it. How pathetic is that? That we, the people who profess to be children of light, are going to a world of darkness and asking them for their counsel and asking them to decide among us who are children of the light. It's an absolute pathetic picture of a church. But you know what? So many congregations are filled with people who won't let things go. It's some little minor thing that's upset them 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Some little minor, someone borrowed a tool and didn't bring it back. You didn't go ask them about it. You just, you know, you, you let it go. You didn't say anything about it, but it's a sore that's been festering in your heart. What, did, did it really matter? Does it matter breaking the fellowship and the unity of the church? Does it matter? I mean, a screwdriver, a tool, a, a hammer, a, a bucket of nails. I mean, think about it, if you will. Every bit of it's going to burn. Every bit, God can give you 10,000 more buckets of nails. God can give you five more screwdrivers. What difference does it make when you really count the eternal weight of sometimes the grievances that we have? They are so pathetically small compared to the eternal weight of the glorious gospel of God and the glorious inheritance that Christ has given unto his people. But at the root, I want you to see what's going on. The root is this. The church is appealing to the world for an answer. The church is looking to the world for guidance. We are in a terrible spot when we look outside that world. I know I'm going a little slow this morning, but you hold on and hang with me because I've got something to say in this passage. And that right now when we look out beyond and we go out there and we look at that world as if they have something to offer us. Uh, tell me how can that which is darkness make a decision between men who are to be men of light. Men who have the wealth of the scripture. Men who have the wealth of the teachings of Jesus Christ. I mean the law of the Old Testament is unsurpassed in its justice. Uh, and you want to know what, an, what a real justice is administered that of the Old Testament it was eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that was justice but Jesus said don't worry about that he said an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth we are a people that don't have to have every little thing treated justly and rightly no sir even when we're buffeted for things we did not do we will take it patiently and grow so forth the patience and the endurance of Jesus Christ unto a wicked and vile world yeah. And he goes on to tell them, don't be deceived. Do you know how often today that the church is looking to the world for wisdom? We look to the world for methods and means of how to build our churches. We follow their practices in forms of entertainment, in forms of music, hello now, in styles of dress. And in many marketing methods and schemes, we begin to treat culture as if it's some kind of, of, of marketing segment that we're going to reach. And so if we're going to reach this segment of the culture, hmm, well, how does the world reach that segment of the culture? And they got this product. They developed this slogan. And they developed this kind of, uh, of method to go out. And they're being successful and they're making money. And we look at that and we think, hmm, how can I do that? And so we develop our slogans. Uh, and we go out and we have our, our marketing 
marketing concepts. I'm telling you, you don't build the church on the world's principles. You go out there and you preach the gospel. You tell the story of Jesus Christ. You tell it to the rich. You tell it to the poor. You tell it to the slave. You tell it to the master. You tell it to the man. You tell it to the woman. You tell it to the child. You tell it to the adult. You tell it. It doesn't make any difference whether he is a high official of state or he's a hobo that's riding the train. It doesn't make any difference. The same Jesus saves every man and the same blood cleanses from sin and you got to preach the same gospel no matter where you're at. We're not saved by the power of the intellect. We're saved by the delivering power of God Almighty. We are facing a battle today to maintain the purity of our faith, our thought life, our principles, our, our, our found fundamentals, our, the manner by which we order and direct our lives is being influenced by the worldly thought life and philosophies that we are confronting on a daily basis over the internet and, and the television, on the radio, on the billboard, in the stores, in the news every day. We are being bombarded with humanistic, secularistic philosophies and you can say what you want to. They are affecting how we think. Amen. Let's just go a little further. Stay with me in this passage. And he says, let me tell you something about that crowd. Don't be deceived. Their lifestyles they lived, he said, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those folks are not going to judge the world to come. They may be sitting in magistrate benches today, but they will not be sitting there in the kingdom that's coming. They may be judging among men today. We may today have civil leaders that are lost and sinners. And we have policemen and we have magistrates that are unregenerate. They're not born again. They don't know God. And they are making decisions that affect our lives. They are making decisions about our society and our culture. And that's affecting our lives. But I'm telling you, that is a temporary situation. Because the day is coming when Christ is going to reign visibly in this earth. And the saints of the world will be the judges of the earth and they will judge among the angels and they will judge among one another of the magistrates and the judges and those that are there to be the officers and leaders in the kingdom of God will not be the unregenerate they will be the born again Holy Ghost filled people that are living in the light of God's word and administering justice based on the book and nothing less than that and he goes to talk about them. He says they're fornicators, they're idolaters, they're adulterers, they're effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. Literally, that is, they're homosexuals. You just want to make a little note in your King James Version, if you write in your Bible, when it says abusers of themselves with mankind, it's one Greek word, and it means homosexual or sodomite. I mean, this is a clear, clear clear i don't know how you put it any more simpler than first corinthians 6 and verse 9 to clearly demonstrate that a sodomite a fornicator a homosexual will not go to heaven end of story you can go to heaven if you'll repent and turn from your sin but without repentance and turning from your sin you will not enter in the kingdom of God you will not sit you might sit we might have homosexuals sitting on the seat of judgment today we might have idolaters sitting and teaching in our schools today we might have the sodomites and the effeminate and they the, become the leaders and they're the ones that are controlling the media and they've gotten a foothold a stronghold in the educational institutions of our hour but that's not going to happen all the teachers in the new kingdom will be born again glory to God full of God almighty every professor who will teach in the kingdom of Jesus Christ will give credence to Christ and love him and be born by him there will be not one homosexual ruling there will not be one sodomite there will not be one effeminate person there will not be one who is lost and living in sin and darkness thieves covetous drunkards revilers extortion go through the whole list none of them he said, that's what you were, that you've been washed and sanctified and justified. And then he goes on to show some things. And I, I want to point some things out because I believe this to be utterly consistent with the, with the passage and, and, and with the, the context of this immediate passage and also the context of the entire book. I'm going to note some phrases. 
it appears that Corinth has picked up some of the lingo and language of their culture. You know how much today we pick up the lingo of our culture and we say phrases and say things simply because it's what the world's doing. It's not biblical. It's not something that's edifying. It's not something that's helpful in the church. We just, we just pick this mess up. Let's look at a few. I believe chapter uh, 6, verse 12, all things are lawful unto me. I don't think Paul is espousing that and, and, and saying that in this phrase. I believe it's something that they picked up from the world because Paul's going to answer it and he's going to respond to it. And there may be even some truth in it. Sometimes there's truth in what the world says. The problem is, is what direction is it taking you? What, where, where is it? What, what influence and impact is it having on your life? How is it influencing you? Is it bringing you closer to God or taking you further away? Come on, brother. Go ahead. Verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, I believe is another one. Down to verse 18. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. And most likely chapter 7 and verse 1, the last phrase, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, I think these are phrases because of the way that Paul responds to it. They're sayings that the church has picked up in the world. These are things that probably are, are going along with the ideologies and the philosophies of the world. And, and they're, they're now influencing and affected. And they become some of the, the, the idioms and the sayings of the church. Paul, when he talks about, you'll read this phrase throughout the epistles. He talks about, and this is a faithful saying. And this is a faithful saying. God came in the world to save sinners of whom I, I am chief. This is a faithful saying he talks about in Timothy. And you could preach some about those faithful sayings. Indicating there were some sayings in the church that weren't faithful. There were some kind of phrases and, and things and the jingles or whatever you want to call them. Jingles or whatever that they say. Idioms we call them is a proper term. But they are this kind of little uh, phrases that we use. And some of them aren't faithful they're not true and they don't need to come off the lips of a saint of God I'm telling you at many times if you're not careful you're out there you work among it you see it all the time and you become bombarded with it and you begin to pick up the jingles and the idioms of the world and it begins to have an influence on your life because it affects how you perceive and look at things it's just again let's look at it all things are lawful unto me. Paul says, okay, so be it. If that's what you want to say, and that's your saying, all things are lawful unto me. All right, Paul says, but let's not end the story there. We don't live by all things are lawful. We live by uh, all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The idea of all things being lawful simply means that all things are within my power. And there's truth in that. That's okay. There's truth in that. As a Christian, God doesn't tie my hands. God doesn't save me and put me in a lockbox. God doesn't save me and lock me up and isolate me from my culture. He saves me and sends me out into my culture to preach the gospel and to be a light unto this world. No, He doesn't save me and isolate me. He saves me and sanctifies me to keep me from the evil that is in this world. Glory to God. But I want you to know that's true that everything I've got just as much liberty to go to a bar today as anybody in the world does I can go to a bar if I want to God doesn't keep me in my house I'm not under house arrest I can go anywhere that I want in the world I can go to any store I can go to any place as long as the country doesn't restrict me I'm able to do that but just because it's within my power doesn't mean it's something that's good and beneficial to my life just because a Christian can doesn't mean that he's should just because you think that you have the ability to do it doesn't mean that it's something you should do we live by a higher principle the world lives by the principle if it's mine and it's my right I'm going to indulge myself in it if I want to do it I will do it but Christians live by a higher principle one is the principle of edification if it doesn't build me up it will ultimately destroy me and therefore I must consider its ultimate effect on my life does it bring me closer to God or take me further away does it strengthen my resolve in Christ or does it weaken it does it make me better able to withstand the attack of the enemy or does it make me weaker to withstand the attack of the enemy what is the ultimate issue of this thing on my life which I choose to do So yes, all things are are lawful, he says. That's your case. 
kind of like a play on words. All things are in my power, but I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. Just because it's in my power, you know what? We need to make sure it stays that way and it doesn't become something that enslaves me. And that's what particularly happens. We've got a church world that has said, you can't show me a scripture again. It's the, you can't show me anything where it's wrong in the word. Well, you can't preach against that because there's no Bible against it. That may be true, but look at what it's doing. It's enslaving you. It's got you. It's got its meat hooks in you and it's dragging you down. You're less spiritual than you used to be. Come on now. You ain't got the fire in Christ. You ain't got the love for the book you used to have. You ain't got the love for prayer that you used to have. Your worship isn't as excited and full of joy as it used to be. No, okay, we don't have chapter and verse to condemn it, but I'll tell you what we've got. Uh, you're becoming under the power of this. Uh, instead of you controlling it, it's starting to control you. Uh, instead of you being able to use it as a tool, you're becoming the object of its desire and the slave of its mastery. So it's not wrong so much because there's something inherently evil in, in and of itself. But it's wrong because of the effect and influence that it's having upon your life. Whew, glory to God. Well, I'm just going to say it right here, but it, we may be bringing it up again in the passage. You know, we got a lot of folks in the church world today think it's okay to, to drink alcohol. Drink wine, whatever, a little whiskey, and of course, that's it. Well, you can't show me where it's wrong in the Bible. And Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for the stomach's sake. And as long as I don't get drunk. Well, first of all, that's a pretty big statement right there. But let's just do something here for a moment. Let's just do something. Let's say that the argument is not there in Scripture. In other words, the Scriptures that talk about look not upon the wine... When it moves in the cup, when it's red and it turns, don't look upon it. I mean, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The deceptive powers of it are unreal. <laughs> and you're a fool <laughs> to think that you can master wine. Because more often than not, it masters everyone that comes to it. Come on. I mean, we can go through those verses of Scripture. You can go to the other minor prophets. He says, woe to the man that gives his neighbor strong drink and he may look upon his nakedness. Again and again, there are plenty of Scriptures that condemn the use of intoxicated right. beverages. We do realize and understand that in their day, they, uh, pasteurization was not yet, uh, had come to them and Louis Pasteur did not live during that time. And please understand that they had absolutely no ability to preserve grape juice unless they made it wine. If not, the only way they could ever enjoy the juice of the vine was when it was fresh and they, could, and they had no way. Today it's nice. We can enjoy it. We can apply uh, 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 pasteurization. Thomas Welch was able to apply Louis Pasteur's method of pasteurization to wine. And now you and I can enjoy grape juice from grapes that were, were grown years or whatever months or years ago. And there's no alcoholic content whatsoever and has a wonderful health benefit to our bodies. And we can and drink the fruit of the vine. They did not have that ability in their day. Right. So please recognize that. You just let the grape juice go. You have to do something to it. You have to put it through a process in order to age it and in order to preserve it. If you don't, basically it will spoil. It won't be fit for anything. Not for human consumption whatsoever. So aside from that, but let's just say for a moment that that's not enough for you. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. It's not enough for you to understand, okay, well, even if you want to make an excuse for it, in 1 Timothy, when Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for the stomach's sake, not for social conversation's sake. Hello? Not so you can fit in sake. Not so that you don't bear the reproach of Christ's sake. Hello? But because of your infirmity. You're often infirmity, not even your once in a while infirmity, but something that plagues you, something that's chronic in your body that is putting you, weakening you, and making it very difficult for you to even function and do what you need to do. Okay, for that sake, take some wine. But if that's not enough for you, 
It ought to be. This passage ought to put the clicker on it here and here alone. Tell me, please tell me, in our culture, in our families, in our churches, I don't care where you want to put it, you tell me what good alcoholic beverages have done for society. Tell me what great benefit we have derived from beer. Tell me what great strengthening we've accomplished in our families from the drinking of wine and the drinking of whiskey. I'll tell you what we've got. We've got in row, skid row, and we've got places full of men that are under the bondage of it. We've got broken homes. We want to fuss about guns. Oh, we don't like it when someone gets shot. I don't like it either if it's an unjust killing. It's wrong and it's against God's word. But I don't hear a national outcry when a drunk driver crosses the line and, he, and he's killed folks. I know we've got this group and that group. I'm telling you right now, mothers against drunk drivers, whatever and all that, but they haven't cut it out. It's still there and it's still 50,000 I think. There's thousands and thousands of people that die every year all because of alcohol. I'm telling you the hospitals are full of people because of alcoholic beverages. It's one of the number one killers in our nation. And it destroys your body. And there's science there to prove it. That's not even a biblical argument. It's a secular argument. My point is this. So it's in your power. Show me the edification. Show me how you're doing that. It's going to build the body. And show me please. When you sit on the church bench. With this brother over here who last week. God pulled out of the drunken skid row that he was on. The drunken stupor that he had been in for months upon end. And he came and heard the glorious gospel. And got liberated. Hallelujah. And God took out of him every ounce of addiction. Every ounce of desire for the alcoholic beverage. And now he goes home. And his kids delight to see him. He no longer beats his wife. He no longer wastes his money. And gets stoned. And gets drunk. And you're sitting on the seat. And you invite him over for the evening meal. And you have your little sip of wine. I'm telling you. He came out of that mess. He knows where it leads to. He knows where to take it to. And you be the one that gives him the sip. And sends him back to his destruction. Show me where it edifies the church. And has any value whatsoever. For our spirituality and well being. We are becoming an alcohol crazed society. We need another Billy Sunday to raise up. Right. Amen. And preach his sermon on that demon alcohol. He saw more drunks rescued. He preached it. Folks didn't like it. But I'm telling you, there was such so bad it hadn't changed. The nature of alcohol hasn't changed. It was so bad across this nation. At one time, we even had a constitutional amendment to get rid of it and prohibit it. You might not agree with that method. You might say, well, it didn't work. I agree with that in that regards. I'm not going to debate that issue. But what I'm telling you is that there was enough people that had sense in this world that said, it's killing us. It's destroying us. And its nature hasn't changed. You can go on your college campuses uh, and I'm telling you young men and women uh, are going to uh, binge drinking uh, and it's destroying their lives uh, it is sopping our resources uh, it's tearing apart families uh, innocent people die on the road every day because somebody is drunk uh, and out of their out of their senses uh, and then somebody in a church wants to rise up and, this, uh, and, and, and flaunt their liberty I'm telling you it's not edifying uh, and I'm telling you it is the, one of the most enslaving sins in all of the world and you want to toy and play around with that mess. Do you think you're going to conquer something that has conquered people for ages and centuries? What, do you think you're better than Noah? Hello? I mean, just tell me. You're going to overcome it? No. All right, I made my point, I think. He goes on, gives another meats for the belly and the belly for meats. I do not believe that is a saying that Paul is espousing. It doesn't even sound like Paul. That's not his kind of preaching. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. That has no basis in Scripture. That's something they picked up out of that wicked worldly culture somewhere. Paul says, yeah, 
Here's my response. God's going to destroy both it and them. He's going to take away that appetite and destroy it, and he's going to destroy the meats as well. I'll tell you what, all the things this culture is indulging on, they can indulge on it, they can talk about its pleasure, they can say, look at it, it's great, I got this, I got that, and it's a wonderful thing, and I'm telling you right now, it's killing us, and one day God's going to wipe it out. You'll come the day that that will be of no value whatsoever. No, I'll tell you what Paul says. He says, the body... Is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Your body is to serve a higher purpose than simply to be something that you indulge in pleasure after pleasure. When God saved you, He didn't just save your heart. He didn't just save your spirit. He saved your body. <laughs> he died for that body. He died for that spirit. He died for that soul. He died for your mind. He died for your will. He died for your knee. Hello? He died for your elbow. He died for your pancreas. He died for every bit of you. I'm telling you right now. When he died on that cross and redeemed you, he didn't just redeem something that was floating around inside of you. He redeemed every bit of you. Every hairs of your head are numbered. And God died for every one of them. I'm telling you, we need to understand that our Lord owns us. He bought us and he owns us and our bodies are to serve a higher purpose than to give them to the pursuits and pleasures of our wicked culture. Amen. God's going to, well, by the words, this body is dying and it's going to go back to the dust. True. But that's not the final say. And that will not be its final state. He goes on to tell us in the next verse that God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by His own power. That body that you were used to do anything you want with, God died for it and He's going to one day, He loves it, He loves you and He's going to resurrect it for it. He's going to change it. He's going to transform it. But at the same time, it's going to be, He's going to transform what's not there. He's not going to annihilate what is there and put something entirely new in, in its place. Uh, he's going to take what is there and transform it and make it into a new state. It's still going to be flesh, uh, but it'll no longer be flesh and blood. It'll be flesh and bones. Uh, it'll have a new life source. Uh, it'll probably be no longer the life of the flesh is in the bud, blood. Uh, it'll be the life of the flesh is probably by, by, again, the Holy Spirit or some other life-giving force that flows differently in that body. I don't know. However, all that may come together, but the point is this. Uh, that body is important to God. And what you do in it matters to Him. How you treat it, where you take it, how you use it, how you flaunt it, and what you say with it, what you act with it, makes a difference to God. My people do not take for granted the word that you have. Do not take for granted the teaching. Do not take for granted the things that I have given unto you. Use them. Use them and apply them. Use them and apply them lest I take them from you. My people, my words must sink in you. This world will influence you. It will deceive even those who, who seem to be the strongest. It will deceive, but you must stay close to me and follow my word. And only as you stand on my word will you be able to make it in this hour. Trust me and follow me and withstand the evil that's in this day and do not allow it to influence you, saith the Lord. Mm. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me a few more minutes. I want to finish this chapter. Glory to the Lord. Paul goes on to talk about, he gets another saying, verse 18. Every sin that a man does is without the body. Again, this is not consistent with Paul's theology to make that Paul saying. It, it, it's not consistent. 
with the word of God that every sin that a man does is without the body. No, no quite frankly, the next statement that Paul makes is what's biblically consistent, but he that commits fornication. And he uses that sin because that's the sin he's dealing with. He dealt with it in chapter 5. He d- mentions it again in chapter 6, and it's mentioned at the beginning of chapter 7. Fornication is a chief sin in Corinth. It is a big sin in Corinth. And I'm telling you, the prominent sins of our culture will be our greatest challenges. Whatever wickedness our culture makes prominent will be the area that you and I will have to deal with most frequently and will be one of our area of greatest challenges. Tell me today that this sin, sexual sin, is inundating our culture. It is prevalent among our culture and it is a great problem in the church world. Amen. Amen. Homosexuality is bombarding the world and the church is succumbing to it. Adultery is prevalent in the world and the church is yielding to it. Fornication is prevalent in the world and the church is yielding to it. Now Paul's idea is this, that the body belongs to the Lord and that whatever sin you do, you do it against the body. I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't care who you are in this world. Whenever you sin, you sin in your body. You live in that body. Well, Brother Woods, I just had a sin of the thought. Well, what do you use to think with? Your toe? You got a brain, right? Where's your brain at? Hello? It's in your body. I'm going to tell you right now. And you express that thought. Let that thought And tell me that if you truly sin in your thought and let your thoughts go wild, tell me that if wild thoughts don't stir wild emotions, tell me that if perverse thoughts stir perverse emotions, you cannot have sin in the mind and it not somewhere touch even the rest of the body. It'll animate the feelings. It'll stir up emotions. If you think something that makes you angry before you know it, your face will turn red without ever saying a word. The thought life can make the countenance change and your whole spirit becomes tainted by it. You can have think about sensual thoughts and before you know it, your body feels like it's titillating and tingling all over and you've got to bring yourself under constraints. You can't just sin with the mind and it not affect other aspects of your body. You do it enough, you'll begin to fulfill it in a physical manner somewhere. Hello? Hello? I know this gets down where we live. But where'd we get that junk? Paul was on to tell him, don't you know your body? It's not a tavern. It's not a theater. So you can put everything you got on display. It's not a tavern so you can make it a drunken bar room special. It's a temple. It's a sacred place where God's presence is to abide. Oh, hallelujah. That's why you should say, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, where is the high living? Tell me the predominant attitude of the church world today is this. We're not preaching the high standard of God and moral perfection. We're preaching low life. We're making excuses. Often preach that hard to run somebody off. Well, I don't think you got to go that far. Well, Paul's going that far. Paul's taking them beyond the letter of the law and he's digging down to the influence and the effect that it has on a man's life. He said, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. Where is that moral preaching? Where is that high life? Why are we so content with a preacher who just tickles our ears or scratches our itch rather and just makes us feel good about ourselves? We are no different than that wicked vile world that's headed to hell. Somebody's got to stir us up to say, quit making excuses. We're not here to imitate that world. We're here to imitate Christ. We're not here to appease that world. We're here to convict it and convert it to Jesus Christ. We've put too much under the category like Corinth. It doesn't matter. When you let enough it doesn't matters go on in the church. And before you know it, 
you'll find out it did matter. And a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And you'll find out where it seemed to be just a little bit of extravagance and a little bit of immodesty in the appearance. And before you know it, you got babies born out of wedlock. And before you know it, you've got illegitimate births and situations. And before you know it, you've got a, a, a worldly spirit and mentality and music that's crept into the church. And the very life and vibrancy of the church is gone. And you become an entertainment center. And you become nothing more than a concert hall. And you're no longer that spiritual body of Christ that brings conviction upon a lost and dying world. I'm telling you, we got to maintain our faith, our principles, our purity that keeps us separate from the ideologies of this world. We don't think like they do. We don't perceive like they do. Paul says, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Because he went on, that's the two things he dealt with. He dealt with the body. He said the body is not for fornication. It's for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Wow. In other words, if my body is for the Lord, that means that my body can serve the high end purpose of fulfilling his will. And that becomes its chief aim and, and purpose for existence is to satisfy and fulfill the very ends, goals, and purposes of the divine will. Imagine that, that your body can be used by an omnipotent, sovereign, holy God to achieve his ends, to accomplish his goals and his purposes. Oh, hallelujah. God wants to reach a lost and dying world, and he can use your body in the process of doing it. God wants to convict a wicked age, and he can use your body, but he can't use your body to convict a wicked age when you're using your body to live like that wicked age. He can't use your body to reach out and preach the gospel to the world when you're using your body to live out the philosophies of our age. And so, your body is for the Lord. His use. And he said the Lord is for the body. I'm going to tell you that God's presence in your body will have a very, very great beneficial effect. <laughs> the Lord is out for you. I will tell you right now that wine is not for the body. It will destroy it. Come on now. I'm here to tell you cigarettes are not for your body. They will destroy it. I'm here to tell you that illicit sex is not for your body. It will destroy your body and bring disease and things that will cripple. But I'm telling you living a holy life and having the presence of God is for your body. Glory to God. It will help you not hurt you. It will keep you and not leave you. It will preserve you and not lose you. It will make you a person that's strong and greater not less hallelujah Woo, praise the Lord God is for you and then he said glorify him in your spirit because he said whoever's joined to the Lord is one spirit and so glorify God in your spirit because both of these belong to God you know, sometimes folks, I've seen some folks that in some sense they glorify God in their body, they dress right, they do right in terms of their activities and they, you know, they refrain from the evil practices and typically live a decent life externally. But I'm telling you, their spirit's rotten. Hello? That spirit is... is all cranktified instead of sanctified. That spirit's just irritated and irascible. I mean, that spirit is something that's just full of rancor and bitterness and envy and, and lust. And that spirit, that, that those Pharisees had it all right for the most part on the outside, but inwardly they were sepulchers. Why did sepulchers? They were full of iniquity and excess. And I'm telling you right now, not only am I to glorify God on the outside, I'm to glorify Him on the inside. I'm to have 
have this consistency in my life. My life is to be one of order and without contradiction. I don't need to have a spirit and character trait that is contradicted by an external appearance. If the character trait is modest and humility, then let the dress say humility and not be flaunting and not be seductive. Come on now. If I'm going to have a spirit that is obedient, then outside there ought to be a yes sir and a no sir and a yes ma'am and a no ma'am. There ought to be something on that outside that is consistent with the spirit of obedience. The act of submission to authority. Long hair and a lady isn't going to do an ounce of good unless behind that external biblical natural symbol is a meek and quiet submissive spirit that is consistent glory while the angels are looking on in our worship while the angels are question and wonder about this great salvation because God never died for them I wonder how many angels lost friends if you will how many in that heavenly realm when those fell they lost friends I have no doubt about it they lost comrades but they went down with the devil and got kicked out of heaven with him a third according to Revelation 12 is where we get the number that he had deceived a third of them and they fell but I'm telling you Jesus never went and hung on a cross for an angel he never redeemed them the devil's got no plan of salvation where he can find a way out and a way back home he's gone and he's gone forever when he got kicked out he was kicked out forever when God put him down under judgment he's been judged forever he's never going to get back up he's never going to find be the object of God's love again and they're looking at us pitiful creatures miserable as we are and when God takes on flesh he becomes a man and he goes to Calvary and dies for us and they're looking at us how much more ought we lift up the glorious power of God and reveal the grace of God in our lives many times I don't know how else to say it we make God look like a fool we make God look like he doesn't know what he's doing when he dispensed grace into our life because we took that grace and abused it we took that grace and used it we took that grace and flaunted it and turned it into lasciviousness, Jude said, and denied even the Lord that bought us. And that's what the church of today has done. They've taken their liberties, they've taken their, their indulgences, and they've emphasized their rights instead of their responsibilities. And we've got these hotshot preachers in Houston, Texas, that just wants to give a, 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 a cheesy grin and make everybody feel good about themselves and just tell us that nobody's going down and God wants everybody in heaven. He does want everybody in heaven but not on your terms heaven wasn't formulated for the wicked hell was made for the wicked heaven was made for the saint and if you're going to go there you got to be and have a consistent character or a character that's consistent with that place Amen. you know what there are places that agree with certain character types. Hello? I mean, if you take a modest, dressed, virtuous woman exuding the presence and the glory of God's simplicity, innocence, and purity, and have it walk in a bar room, every head in the bar will turn because it's out of place. On the other hand, take a seductive woman, scantily clad. Hello. Yeah. Looks like she's been through a few ringers and walk in. She may turn heads because she maybe looks good, but she's not out of place. Virtue is out of place in the presence of vice. Virtue is out of place in the presence of wickedness. Glory to the Lamb of God. Let it ever be that so. What's your point, Brother Woods? My point is this. The character in us must be consistent with our actions. And therefore, we must do things that are consistent with being right and living the way God wants us to live. We live by principles higher than what the world does. We don't, we don't live by their philosophies. And I'm here just to put this home to you today. We've got to make sure that we keep our principles, our fundamentals 
fundamentals, our faith, if you will. What we believe, how we believe it, and why we believe it has got to stay true to this book and to the person of Jesus Christ. And we cannot espouse a philosophy simply based on its popularity. Stand to your feet this morning. I just recently typed in Christian slogans. I just jotted down a few of them. Some of them were were decent. Many of them were garbage. But this is the ideas and this is the thinking and mindset that's become prevalent in the church. I jotted a few of them down. One of them said this, When God saw you, it was love at first sight. Nothing could be further than the, from the truth. Where did we get that at? That's the world's language. Love at first sight. Hello. Oh, when I saw that girl's love at first sight. And we've translated that language, that romantic language that really is not even true and biblical either. Amen. Come on. I guarantee there's been many times in your marriage you wasn't thinking about love at first sight. It was more like love at first bite. You're ready to chew them up and spit them out and kick them out. You feel that way toward them. No, sir. Love has become biting instead of inviting. Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, what we do, we're trying to find some kind of gimmick. We're looking for some kind of uh, uh, marketing scheme where we can appeal to that world. When God saw you you, you were lost and undone. You were wicked and there was nothing about you lovely. There was nothing about you enticing. You were regurgitating, repulsive in the sight of God. He didn't love you because you were lovable. He loved you because God is love. Oh, hallelujah. He loved you because He's good. He loved you enough to go die and bring you out of that hole that you were living in. No love at first sight. It's absurd. God wants to be your best friend. You see, there's, there's little glimmers of truth. But that's the image. Go out to that sinner. God wants to be your fresh friend. No, sir. God is your Lord, sir. He'll be your friend, but He's going to be your Lord first. He's your master. He's your redeemer. He's your savior. He died to save you. He owns you. He bought you when He made you. He bought you at Calvary. And He won, giving you an opportunity now to give yourself to Him as a gift and let Him own you that way. But you understand this right now. You'll never know Him as friend until you understand first that He is sovereign and master and creator over all. And God just doesn't want to be your best friend. He wants to be your shepherd and your guide. Amen. Your sovereign, your Lord. That's who He is. Amen. Down in the mouth, you need a faith lift. Jesus, gateway to the supernatural. We have got a pathetic opinion of God. And the church is no longer living at the high moral standard. We are groveling in the mud. We are groveling in the sin of society, trying to find a way to compete. I don't need to compete with that world. My Jesus is supreme to all of that mess. And I'm telling you, I didn't make Jesus. He made me. I didn't invent him. He invented me, if you will. I didn't make him to be king. The Father set him on the throne in the world. I rejected him as king. I hung him on a cross. I said the stone has been disallowed. Loud, send it back and God said I'm going to put it on the throne if God hadn't enthroned him we'd been lost because we wouldn't enthrone him we hung him on the cross and God said that's not the final word I'm going to put him on the throne over all principality and power and everything that's made if God hadn't enthroned him you'd be dead today so I'm telling you our challenge today is to keep our purity by keeping the idioms, the sayings, the philosophies, the perceptions, the ideas, right. the junk, and the way this world thinks is keep it out there and don't let it find its way in here. Exactly. Glory to the Amen. Lamb of God. And our high standard is going to be a high standard that goes beyond that's some, where we're simply looking for permission. 
We want to know the ultimate end of the issue and what it's going to do in our lives and where it's going to lead us to. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You hear me right now. When you've got in you, young man, young woman, old woman, I don't care, but you've got that little spirit rising up that says, oh, wow, I want that new haircut. I, I, I'm just going to, I'm tired of everybody looking at me in my long hair. And I, I'm tired of everybody looking at me like I'm something that walked out of the dinosaur era somewhere. And I'm just so old-fashioned. I'm tired of that. And I just want to be somewhere to fit in so that everybody doesn't look at me and stare at me anymore. That spirit is a spirit of discontentment with the love of God and the grace of God's bestowed upon your life. I'm telling you, you better look out uh, and you better guard against that concept and influence uh, that is coming in your life. Who are you around that's bringing that mess in you? Get among some people of God uh, and some ones that love Jesus Christ and live for Him and let the fire of God burn in your heart and quit looking at the junk that is dragging you down and offending your spirit and making it dirty. Glory to the Lamb of God. Why don't you raise your hand and give Him thanks here this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.